Hi again, uh, back with another one of these informational videos. We kind of thought we'd do just one on this whole COVID-19 thing. Um, don't worry, we're not stopping narrowboat videos at all. Cruising videos will keep coming. We're still catching up to ourselves with the winter cruises. This is not a change in what the channel is. Last video, which we'll link below, is sort of Virology 001. And we got a lot of great feedback about it. We turned off comments, and we're going to turn off comments on this one basically because... Um, although it's lovely to have all the positive comments, there's really a large amount of trolling happening around this event, and we don't want to deal with that. That said, everything that's in there is sort of necessary precursor material to this video, so if you haven't watched that video yet, go back and watch that video. Um, that'll give you the very basics of how viruses work, and today we're going to do a little bit more based on things I've come across and confusion that I've seen since. As the pandemic is progressing, there's a lot of people who are having real concerns and a lot of anger and a lot of confusion around testing. There's a lot of people who are getting, you know, they're really feeling like they're being let down because they don't have tests. And this is true, but. So I want to sort of expand on that true but and try and explain the way that testing for viruses really works. Again, I am not an expert, I'm just a guy with a lot of computer programming experience, some film and video experience, and oddly enough I did a couple of years of pre-med in university, so there are plenty of people who are experts, I am not an expert, but again, if what I'm saying doesn't make sense to you, level up. Go to somebody with a degree in epidemiology or a degree in virology, go to sources like the WHO. At the end of the day, I am a informed amateur at this. Anybody who doesn't know at least as much as me is not even an informed amateur. You can ignore them, especially if they're talking about anything with elderberries. At this moment, um, there are large amounts of independent epidemics in many, many countries, and these epidemics are spreading at different rates, and the European sort of cluster is the largest driver of infections. The United States is having some problems as well. And testing has become an issue because, well, basically because a lot of governments have kind of botched this. And a lot of governments that seem to have succeeded, although there's a little bit of a caveat that we should put on there, those governments have extensively tested, brought out large amounts of tests early, scaled up their testing ability as quick as possible, and that's allowed them to kind of contain the disease. Except for it's a pandemic. The disease isn't contained anymore. So I'm going to kind of try and explain in layman's terms, building up, how we get to what are the tests, why are the tests not available right now, how soon will the tests be available in sort of general terms, and, um, and whether or not you really should worry about it too much at this point. In order to do that, and this is why I left it out of the last video, there are some precursor pieces of information you need to build up to sort of medium understanding to build up to here's how the tests work. So what we've got to do is cover kind of genealogy 001, I'd say even more genealogy 000001, um, immunology 001, basics of how the body defends itself, and then we'll get into um, epidemiology and what this testing is really for and how it will help and or hinder the response to the outbreak. Right, so genealogy, extremely large number of zeros one. This is a bit hard to turn into sort of layman's terms, so let's go back to sort of the beginning. Pretty much everybody has some basic idea of how Morse code works. Morse code is a way of tapping out a message using sounds to communicate letters. You have dots and dashes, and you can send a piece of information by going a quick little beep, which you can think of as a zero, or a long beep, which you can think of as a one. Most people know the SOS message, dot, 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 that communicates SOS. We've decided that there's a way of taking the alphabet and taking little portions of sounds and saying these, this portion represents this letter, this portion represents that letter. We were doing it to tap out just conversations between people, little sort of text messages. For all you kids out there, think of an SMS or a WhatsApp message, but without any emoticons. That is like 
the very, very basics of sort of information transfer, right? You've got the ability to encode a word into a stream of sounds. And if you think about it, that stream of sounds is zeros and ones, which means it's binary. And that means that it's the same as how computers work. And this video you're watching, that's transmitting down a binary pathway. It's just a bunch of ones and zeros. And we have figured out, obviously, by the fact that you're watching this, a way of packing a very large amount of information into a bunch of ones and zeros transmitted really, really fast. Well, genealogy is kind of the same idea. It's making messages and encoding them into the smallest size possible so you can transmit them. But biology doesn't have the same limitations as human beings. I don't need to shove this video down Morse code and you need to wait six months while you listen to a whole bunch of beeps and beeps and beeps and beeps and, you know, type it into your computer as 1010101 and eventually once you've buffered up an extremely large file, play back this video. You want to be able to transmit life, or in the case of viruses, not quite life. So how do you do that? Well, Existence, in the form of evolution, has figured out how to make something called a nucleic acid and join them together into a strand. And that works just like the Morse code. You know, if you take the beginning of the message, you move along with time. RNA and DNA, the two molecules that do this job, are the same thing. You run from one end all the way along, and you can encode a message into it, and you can read it and decode a message out of it. What is that message? There's two different types of primary information systems involved in organisms, and those are RNA, ribonucleic acid, and DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. They're not simple sounding. It's four nucleic acids. In the case of RNA, it's adenosine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. In the case of DNA, three of those are exactly the same, adenosine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. These nucleic acids are attached to a backbone of a sugar. That's the oxyribo portion of the name, or the ribonuclease. Basically, they form a mechanism by which you can make a string of individual acids, and those individual acids can be any one of four different things. Because it's any one of four different things, you can think of it as instead of a binary message, it's a quaternary message. It packs a lot of information into what is actually a relatively short space. So it's a way of encoding very complex information in a relatively compact form. Relatively compact as in the entirety of the instructions for me can fit into a thing you can't see with your naked eye at all. The reality of it is it's an incredibly dense way of transmitting information. RNA is used to transmit proteins. That's it. That's pretty much exactly what it's capable of doing. Um, there's a little bit more to it because RNA is used in the process of assembling DNA, but it basically is you read along the message, and as you read along, you assemble the right chemicals beside that message, and once you've done sort of running along the zipper and you get to the end of it, clink, you've got the protein that that RNA encodes, or the proteins, or the much larger structures of, of multiple proteins, which will glom together and form things. So a virus, or at least a retrovirus, is really just one of these RNA strands encoding a series of proteins, which all, when released together, will combine into the RNA molecule inside of the protein packet, which will also join with fats, like what are called lipids and sugars and things, to create the virus itself. In the case of the coronavirus, it's kind of a round, koosh ball looking thing, holding the RNA on the inside of it, and it's got a bunch of proteins and sugars on the outside. But the virus lacks all of the mechanisms necessary to build this. And it lacks those because it isn't DNA. DNA is the mechanism by which, instead of encoding for proteins, DNA encodes for RNA. DNA is a incredibly complex structure. It's the instructions for how to build an organism. So RNA encodes for a protein. RNA of a long enough strand encodes for a virus. DNA, it's much more dense. It's two strands woven together, wound up over a bunch of proteins. It, it forms your chromosomes. It is used by your cells to say not just how to make a protein, but how to make all of the proteins and all of the complex structures necessary to build the inside of your cell, the nucleus of your cell, which is sort of wrapping the actual DNA 
uh, mechanism and all of the smaller organelles inside of your cell. It encodes for the entire organism. Your cells are essentially just little bags of water and protein and fat whose job is to act as a specialized factory for proteins or for RNA or for whatever it is that that specialized cell is there to do. The instruction set is all in the DNA. The DNA is used to make RNA. The RNA is used to make proteins. This is the simplest form of genealogy I can give you. What you need to think about is it's data. Like I've said with a computer program and you're trying to transmit a video, you're trying to transmit information about how to make a protein or how to make an organism. And there's a signal there that we look for. And this is what all the testing is about. It's about trying to find these signals. There are mechanisms by which we can amplify those signals, something called reverse transcription PCR or polymerase chain reaction, where we can take a piece of RNA and we can use a bunch of biological tricks and magnify the presence of that RNA to build it up in a sample and say, okay, this RNA that encodes for this protein is definitely present in this sample or isn't. So we'll see later that that is sort of the basics of how you will eventually be able to build tests. You'll use reverse um, transcription, which is taking DNA and making RNA or taking RNA and making DNA, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which is used to amplify the amount of signal that those things are providing that we can then use for tests, and proteins and organisms. All of this leads to immunology 001. When a virus gets into you, it tries to attach to a protein or sugar or a complex of both that are found on the cell membrane of some specialized cell in your body. From what we understand right now of the coronavirus, and this is still early days, this virus is highly targeted towards binding to epithelial lung cells. It's, it's the inside of the lungs. When it binds to them, it inserts its RNA, and essentially it tries to get that RNA into the nucleus and then clip itself into the DNA strand of that cell's nucleus, and it's meant to break the cell's ability to replicate itself. So now this DNA no longer encodes for the organism's cell. It encodes instead for making more copies of the virus. It's just hijacked that cell, that factory, and turned it into a mechanism not for building additional copies of your cells, not for building more of you, but instead for building more of the virus. Eventually, the virus builds up to such a level inside of that cell that it causes the cell to split, break, and that cell membrane bursts and all of these viral cells go out into the body and they do their job now of trying to attach to the nearest cell it can find that has ACE2 receptor on it. If it can get you to have a reflex reaction and cough, that cough ejects some of the virus and it still is just looking for the nearest available cell with an AC2 receptor on it. They're very much like a envelope being sent to uh, a destination. If it gets to the right address, it sticks to it, it stays there and it does its thing. If it doesn't get to the right address, it just eventually either gets destroyed or it waits and that's it. It's, it's not malicious. There's nothing about the virus that's trying to get to you. There's nothing about the virus that is actually trying to harm you. It's just, I'm a mechanism for attaching to a cell. If I find the right cell, I'll attach to that cell and I'll inject this RNA into it and I'll make more of me. Well, I'll get you to make more of me. That is what makes the symptoms that you're experiencing. In the case of this virus, your lung epithelial cells start to break and they start to release fluids into your lungs. Those fluids have high concentrations of the virus itself and some of that is responded to you by your body and some of it is ejected by your body, like it just causes a reflex reaction. That's its way of transmitting itself to another or transmitting itself further inside of you. So that manifests itself initially as that dry cough. You're, you're coughing up um, literally viral particles. It also will eventually manifest as a fever. Now the fever isn't actually the virus's action. The fever is instead your body trying to respond and the immune response is the system inside your body, and well, it's actually inside every one of your cells. It is consistently trying to recognize a virus, 
there's a uniquely identifying thing, a protein or a sugar on the surface of the virus, which your body's cells think of as kind of a key that it can lock onto. These are called antigens. And when it starts to recognize a bunch of them, it can try and differentiate that this bad cell, this cell that's gone nuts and started producing viruses, has been infected by these sugars and proteins. So it can try and identify the protein coat on the virus. And essentially your body tries to respond to that by flooding the area around it with lymphocytes, which are cells that are specialized towards immune reactions. This whole action of your body now trying to produce many more of those lymphocytes and get them to the right area and get those lymphocytes acting as their own little factories to try and build up a response called antibodies to those antigens on the virus is what drives your fever. That's what drives your heat up. It's literally your body is metabolizing faster as if you were running or as if you were exercising really hard to try and do as much as it can in a short amount of time to respond to this potentially lethal thing that it has encountered. So the fever is the symptom of you fighting back. The cough is the virus trying to do its thing. The fever is you trying to fight back. Assuming you survive, and most of us do, what you're going to have inside of you now are antibodies. Your body will have produced proteins called immunoglobulins that are able to bind to, as kind of a puzzle piece, the, the membrane and protein coat of the virus. You kind of have to think of it like this. You don't want to have the wrong puzzle piece, right? You, you don't want to have false positives. You don't want your body to identify something like your lung cells and say, you know, they're healthy and say, destroy that. You want to find the dangerous thing, build up an antibody towards that dangerous thing and be able to uniquely identify it and say, look, if I ever find myself attaching to anything whatsoever, send a signal to the rest of the body to come here, send out the lymphocytes, send out what are called macrophages and either digest, destroy, encompass, or otherwise kill whatever the heck I'm attached to. That's an immunoglobulin. It is like a signal, again, signal and noise, that when it finds an antigen and binds to it, it just screams as loud as it can, alarm, 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 and the immune response can come and deal with it. This is what builds up accumulated and acquired immunity so that the next time you encounter the same virus, you will have hopefully a successful response. The antibodies will bind, the signal will go out, your body will flood that area with lymphocytes, the lymphocytes will simply stop or kill the virus before it has a chance to actually act, and you don't lose any cells, you don't have any damage, and you're immune from now on, or at least you're more immune. So the most important mechanism for trying to find the virus inside the body, th this is the complicated bit, right? The, the the first thing you can do is find, typically in an autopsy or in cells of somebody who's very, very sick, you can go in and scrape bits of tissue, like from the lungs and things, or in an autopsy of someone who's died, you can actually, you know, um, during the autopsy, take portions of tissue. And now that you've got these tissues, you can start to try and find inside of that the signal that is the virus itself. You're doing the same job as the antigen response is. We've got this whole mechanism called CRISPR inside of all of our cells whose job is to respond to viruses. And you can imagine the CDC and the WHO as our communal version of that. But human beings are very slow compared to cells. But the first response is We've noticed that somebody has some unique disease. In this case, it was around January 1st. There were people showing up with an unknown, they call it an etiology. They had no reason to have the pneumonia they had. It wasn't obvious where the pneumonia was coming from. And as these people got particularly sick and started to die, they started to look at the lung tissues in these people. And as they found those lung tissues, they found all the damage that had been done. They knew something was up, but they have to use microscopy and and a whole bunch of chemistry to try and figure out what's actually happened in there. Actually, very quickly, around January 7th, they had isolated the actual viral DNA. Then they use that thing called RT-PCR to allow you to build up large copies of the RNA. Essentially, you want to have the full sequence of the RNA. You don't want to just have little fragments. You want to be able to recognize it in the same way that the body needs to recognize the specific portions of the coat so forensic pathologists and epidemiologists can look at the 
tissues of somebody who's had um, a severe infection, and they can try and find and amplify the signal and figure out what in this mess of tissues and stuff is human cells and what of it is unimportant bacterial fragments and what of this is just normal bodily RNA for creating proteins and which portion of this is the actual viral RNA. The body is trying to respond to the protein coat by creating an antibody response to antigens. The scientists are trying to find the entire ribonucleic acid chain. That ribonucleic acid chain, once they've got enough copies of it, it allows them to literally create um, a sequencing of the genome. I told you before, there's four things in the signal, right? Adenosine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. Those four things literally can be represented as A, C, G, U, and the RNA can be represented once you sequence it as a really long text file of those four letters, those four letters, those four letters, those four letters, those four letters. And if you just read along it to the end, you've got the entire genome. Yeah, so as soon as you've got that sequence and you've got the complete sequence of the virus, you can literally email it to people and they can start going, okay, on this huge thing with millions upon millions and upon millions of individual letters, do I recognize or can I figure out a way of recognizing, can we find sections that are uniquely identifying to this virus? And those uniquely identifying sections are what you can use to start trying to build tests. And that's when you get into epidemiology. You know, you've got sort of multiple stages. You've got that initial outbreak, epidemic, pandemic, and then a pandemic can become endemic, where this virus is now everywhere and it's permanently there. Each of those has sort of a management stage. Once you've got to endemic, you've probably developed all the tests you need to be able to identify whether or not somebody's got something, but it's been a very long time from that initial outbreak. In the initial outbreak, you just want to be able to confirm, track, and rule out who doesn't have it and rule in who does have it and try and create that kind of mechanism for containment. And in this case, we've got this situation where in the last couple of days, a lot of people are hitting Facebook and things because they're pissed off because their governments in their regions have decided that they're not going to give testing to anybody but critical patients. And people are pissed because there's all these people who are at home and they're like, I just want to know. But this is where you got to sort of understand these stages. The virus begins to break out. The first few cases are found January 1st through January 7th. By January 7th, an incredibly fast amount of time compared to any other one of these diseases that's ever popped up. We've got scientists in China announcing to the world that they've got the genome and the genome is literally being emailed. And people who are receiving that email are beginning to get their computer programs working on trying to figure out what could be a possible response to this. Is there a test we can make? And the first tests are very unscalable in the same way that, that you've got people where, where in the very beginning, you can only identify the genome by sort of slicing into tissues from people who have died. Now, you don't want to do that to everybody, so <laughs> you, you, you figure out as quickly as you can, is there a way of saying, okay, we now have identified this virus, can we take this virus, take a simple sample from somebody, do something to magnify that signal, and go, yes, this person has had the virus, or no, this person hasn't. Well, that's the RT-PCR tests. Those are the ones where you're doing that reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. So you take a swab from the air pathway of a person, mucous membranes, that sort of thing, and you run RT-PCR on it to amplify that particular RNA. You now know what RNA you're looking for because we've gotten the genome from China. We can use this test. If that RNA is present, we can create a DNA copy and then use, um, you know, cells basically to make many, 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 many copies of it. And you can see using statistical analysis and a lot of incubation hardware and stuff, you can figure out after about 24 hours to three days that yes, this signal was present or no, this signal wasn't present. Either the RNA was there or the RNA wasn't there. And so you've now got a test, but this test is extremely unscalable, right? Um, literally you have to take 
cells from somebody and then you have to take enough of those cells that you can put them into a bunch of pipettes and you need to take the pipettes and put them into a bunch of little tubes and in those tubes you put the right chemicals in there to create all the dna that's going to be required you put the whole thing into sort of a machine that has an incubator um, it runs the reaction you build up all these copies if you've got that right piece of equipment and you can get that test done you can now say yes this person had it or didn't have it labor intensive needs specialist people needs specialist machinery very expensive specialist machinery not everybody has it. Not every country on the planet can can afford to have many of them. Um, most of them will be in centralized locations. So you've got the problem of shipping stuff from point A to point B. This is not scalable. They're moving as rapidly as they possibly can, but these non-scalable tests need to be applied to people you actually believe might have the virus. I identify it in a person who is sick. If they're positive, now you want to identify it in every person they had contact to, including the healthcare providers that they're that have been treating them, their families, whoever they've been in close contact to. Then you want to start testing the people who are the tertiary connections, who have contacted those people but haven't contacted the original person. And you can see that really rapidly, the number of tests that required balloons at a, at a rate bigger than the virus itself grows, <laughs> and the tests can quickly be overwhelmed. So you have this triage problem. You, you can sort of think of an epidemic as a bomb going off in slow motion. You have people who are immediately injured very, very badly, and they're, they're not walking away, and they need major care. And then you've got the people who are kind of the walking wounded. These are the ambulatory patients. They're not doing well, but they're not going to die right now. Then you've got the people who have minor wounds, and you've got people who don't have even minor wounds. They've just got minor concerns. Their ears hurt. They're thinking, have I been affected by this event? But they haven't. And the people doing triage have to sit there and say, based on what we understand of this thing at this moment, and what we know about this bomb going off, you have zero chance of having been contacted by shrapnel. I don't care how much you want to get a test, there is absolutely no reason to test you. Now you are walking wounded. In the beginning, you try and test those because, because those people are the potential growing front of the explosion. Unlike a bomb going off, they're the shrapnel. They're going to keep injuring other people and other people and other people. So you want to try and contain that. But once you get to pandemic, you can't contain that. And you can't scale up and you can't provide tests to everybody. So you have to prioritize those tests. And the systems in many countries that have gone to, we're in full pandemic mode, we have a large outbreak inside of our community, and it is transmitting in and of itself, they have to prioritize towards people who are looking like they're dying. Because in pandemic mode, it's mitigation. Now, instead of trying to track the virus, what you're trying to do is make decisions about the care of the people who have it. So when somebody walks in and they're literally walking in and they're saying, I have a complaint, I feel like I'm sick, I feel like I can't breathe. All right, you're not unconscious and we don't actually have a tube down your throat right now. You're not serious. You're possibly exposed. I'd rather you stay at home, not come in, not potentially risk harming other people. You're possibly sick with something else. I'd rather you not come in and potentially come into contact with this disease. You're quite possibly, you've got a head cold, you've got the flu, you've got any number of other things which have similar symptoms, some of which are dangerous, but most of them aren't. You're better off staying at home and not knowing than you are being in the hospital and knowing, soaking up the the capacity of the system to react for the people who are potentially dying. Just like the triaging for the tests and the priority of where to put resources on the tests, there's priority of where to put resources like ventilators and where to put people. And we've gotten past the point in most of the places where people are going, why am I not getting a test? We've gotten past the point at which it makes sense to try and contain. We still want to know where is this virus and where is it going, but we can't keep the resources focused on that unscalable process, we need a scalable process. Well, that's why we did genealogy and immunology 101. You remember those immunoglobulins, those proteins, those antibodies that your body creates? Well, they're another signal. See, we've got this secondary signal. Once human beings have survived the virus, we know they start producing these antibodies. Once they've got the antibodies, we can start looking at additional multiple proteins. Now I can start 
going, can I identify and magnify the signal of the blood serum? Can I look at the blood and say, yes, this person has immunoglobulin? Because now we can say, if you've got this inside of you, it means you've responded to the virus. But this is not something that develops quickly. You have to wait until people have survived. You have to wait until a large enough number of people have survived that you can compare their serum levels of, of immunoglobulins together to identify that these are the correct immunoglobulins. These ones only exist in people who've had a response. They don't exist in people who've never been exposed. We need to use the non-scalable tests to have identified the unexposed and the exposed. And you cross-reference it all and eventually end up with something where you can go, okay, now, finally, I can create a simple serum test. I can create a test tube that I drop your blood into, shake it up, it changes color. Yes, you've got the virus. Or no, you don't. This is the point at which everything is scalable. This is the point at which everybody can access tests. This is the point that comes in the future from now. The tests are now coming, but they're not there to stop the outbreak. If the system has done its calculus and decided you don't need a test, it's because you don't need a test. You may have the virus, but you don't have sufficient symptoms where if we know or don't know, like if I've got confirmation you've got it or I, or I don't, at the moment there's no change in your care. There's nothing I'm going to do that's different. You're still going to stay at home and, and keep your, yourself isolated and try not to get sicker. And that's it. If you do get sicker, now we have a reason to use the test. We, we want to identify in that person who's, who's in a serious condition, we want to identify, yes, you have coronavirus and we will treat coronavirus, or no, you don't have coronavirus and you probably have the flu or you probably have some kidney disease or something like that, and we want to treat that properly. So for those people, it's a diagnostic tool. For everybody else, it's more or less just comfort. One thing I'm really not trying to do is communicate in any way that the testing isn't important. It's incredibly important. Like we need super wide testing. It's just that in this moment, while tests are not yet available, we can't really ramp up the PCR tests. We need the blood tests for immunoglobulins. We need antigen tests. And it, ultimately we need something that, you know, comes in a little box and is sort of like a pregnancy test and you spit on it or something like that would be ideal. But because this is a novel virus, we've never encountered this before. There's a process that goes into trying to ramp up to the ability to produce those tests in the sort of numbers you require. We need to think about the fact that it's not going to be one test. For anybody that's negative, you're going to be having to test them over and over and over again. If you're really serious, you need to test like at least once a month for a protracted period of time. So the manufacturing capacity just happens to be absolutely enormous and the tests need to be relatively easy to use. It, we're, we're used to the idea that tests are sort of readily available. These aren't. This is a, a novel virus and it is a novel problem. We, we need to find a, the, the RNA response. We need to find the immunoglobulins. We need to find the means by which we create a simple test that can be done in a lab still, but in like in lab conditions with a uh, blood supply. Ultimately, we need to figure out ways of getting the same information from things like uh, saliva and stuff. So you can just spit on a stick and go, yes, positive or negative, like with a pregnancy test. That sort of capacity doesn't ramp up quick, especially on a worldwide basis where you're talking 7.5 billion people who are all capable of being infected. You know, I'm the first to admit that, that large numbers of governments haven't done a great job of communicating and haven't done a great job of sort of responding quickly. We need to get through this period where they're having to switch to this triage moment and for the sake of not running out of testing capacity, they're reserving it for people who that testing capacity will save lives, which means we're losing visibility on the disease itself and how far it's spreading and which countries that have no testing capability at all right now aren't reporting viruses because they don't even know about those viruses. Like we need these tests and we need everybody to have them we need to make it through this moment so that we can produce them. Once we've got the capacity catching up and we get to the point where we've overcome that initial obstacle and that initial slow response, then we definitely need to be in a, in a testing regime of enormous capacity where we're all getting tested so that the world can react properly. So I'm not 
in any way saying don't test. I'm saying don't stress right now about the fact that you don't have a test and you're in an area in which there's the, an outbreak and you're worried. The, the worry is understandable. The desire for the test is understandable. The fact that the test can't be allocated to you is also understandable. And that's all I'm trying to communicate there. It's important for people to hold out some level of trust right now. There are people sharing things like, it's a bioweapon. No, it's not a bioweapon. It's not even remotely possible. The We can't make a computer that talks in quaternary. We don't know how to make a computer that talks in uh, that kind of a signal. We, we, we do not have the knowledge necessary to do much more than essentially what we do breeding dogs. You know, we, we are not at, if we were, we'd have cured cancer long before we used it as a weapon, right? There, there would be no, <laughs> it's just, and also there's all these people saying that's oh, a Chinese weapon that, that it, it, the Chinese are pretty good at tactics. They got tactics going back millennia. They're the oldest, you know, surviving culture basically. And none of those tactics say it's a good idea to take a sword, ram it through your own scrotum so that you can scratch somebody else. It doesn't, these are just absurdity. Stop sharing them. They're just, just the, it, it's just nuts. It's just conspiracy theory. It does nothing of value and it just panics people. We can say definitively that governments have not reacted well to this. So it's been botched, but we're catching up. Like we caught up way faster this time than we did in MERS in 2012 to 14, I believe it is, way faster than we did with SARS in 2002. The ability of human beings to respond collectively to epidemics is still crude, but it is getting better. And these tests, I've tried to convey this, like the tests are hard to develop. In fact, 10 years ago, you could not sequence the DNA of a virus in anywhere near a short enough time. I mean, like you'd be looking at nine months. Now you're looking at a matter of days. That's amazing. You can email these sequences around and, and computers can go to work trying to figure out how to, in a sense, 3D print a response to a particular um, viral coat to make a artificial antibody. We're almost at the point of being able to make artificial antibodies. We are nowhere near the point of being able to make artificial viruses, nor are we anywhere close to being able to make artificial organisms. But we are almost at the point of being able to make, you know, kind of designer proteins fairly quickly. So it's not that this isn't an incredibly serious event. People are going to be scared, understandably, and they're going to want tests because that test gives them some assurance. But there's some fundamentals they should understand about that. Like a negative test does nothing for you except for tell you you haven't been infected yet. That's not very helpful. To have a positive test, you know you had it before. Like if you've gone through the minor symptoms and you've got a positive test, it's good because you probably are partially immune to future outbreaks or partially immune. But it doesn't do anything to change your care, right? Like, like you, 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 you've gone through some symptoms. You've had a cough. You've had a fever. You've gone through that cough and fever. You find out you were positive. It's like, I don't know, a badge of honor, but it's not really, it's not really money or time that is well spent. If you're a, a, a person right now who's having uncomfortable symptoms, you, you, you know, you're having difficulty um, breathing, you're definitely worried. I mean, I'm, I, I feel for you. Like that's gotta be terrifying, but if you're still able to walk and you're not coughing to like the point of coughing up blood, probably going to make it through. So again, the test isn't going to do anything really yet because it won't change any, any sort of response from the system. So again, comfort, but not necessarily a changed response. That's what I'm trying to communicate is don't, worry so much about the tests. Don't worry so much. I get into it too, like on Facebook, like, oh, these governments have screwed up this and everything. Don't really worry about that too much either. Worry primarily right now about staying mentally healthy. 
like doing what you can to adapt to the fact that this is a new normal. So I, I hope that was helpful. Uh, all I wanted to do was communicate to you sort of the basics of how these tests work and how they're developed and the fact that there are sort of non-scalable versions and scalable versions and that it takes time for all of these things to come online. The, the ability to get tested is something that people seem to be really attaching to as, as a, um, this will help me in some way. I've hopefully made that a little bit clearer. A negative test doesn't do anything for you other than give you some affirmation that you haven't been exposed yet. It gives you a reason to keep doing what the rest of us are doing right now, get isolated and practice social distancing and wash your hands and don't touch your face. I'm hoping this is helpful in terms of you understanding a little bit more of the mechanisms behind all of that. And I hope that you're safe at home doing nothing right now, but watching a video, not being transmitted by Morse code.